So, uh, for those who don't know, I have a three-year-old son. His name is James. And back when he was about nine months old, one morning, we are like doing our normal morning routine, eating breakfast, we were eating pancakes. And I don't know if you know this or not, but nine-month-olds are a lot quicker than you think. Uh, especially if you're not like paying attention to them every single second of the day. Because we're eating there, eating breakfast, he's in his high chair, I'm sitting right next to him. And next thing I know, he has the plate that the pancakes are on, holding it up in the air, and he just throws it on the ground, smashes into a million pieces. And because of the noise, he's like freaking out, crying hysterically. I'm like, ah, I, I get him out of his high chair, and I move him into what is called a bumbo seat. Uh, and if you don't know what a bumbo seat is, it's like a mobile, like secure chair for uh, toddlers and infants to sit in so they can eat as well. You can move it around. And so we have ours set um, on uh, our kitchen counter, which is about like dishwasher height. So we always put them on there at that spot while we're like doing dishes. We can feed them, do other things. And so I put him in this chair. He's freaking out. And I leave the room, which is mistake number one. <laughs> But I had to leave the room to go get the broom and dustpan. I'm only gone for like five seconds, I swear. But as I'm walking back into the room, I see my son nose diving off of the counter, going head first straight onto the tile floor. Boom, he hits the tile floor. I mean, he's like freaking out. I like let out this blood curdling scream that I had no idea that was in me. <laughs> I go, I go, I get him out of the bumbo seat, I pick him up, and he's just like dazed, like confused, like huge knot, like the size of a softball is on his forehead, black eye already, and I'm like freaking out, like I don't do well in these situations. So I immediately call the doctor, the doctor's like, well since he's acting that way, go ahead and take him to the ER. It's like, great. Because now, I'm having to call my wife, and let her know that I'm taking our son to the ER. And like I said, I don't do well in these situations. I don't do well at all. So I, I call my wife and, and I'm like, Sarah, it's not good. It's not good. It's like, that's the only words that I could get out of my mouth was, it's not good. It's not good. And she's like, what's not good? And I'm like, James fell and we're heading to the ER. And so we, we get there and me, like, I, in this moment, I'm just full of fear. I'm full of fear of like, what's wrong with my son? Like, is there like more than just like a, a bruised eye? Is there more like damage to his brain? Did I give him a concussion? Like, am I gonna get arrested for this? Like, am, am I gonna like win like the worst father of the year award? Like, like, I'm a horrible parent. Like all these fearful thoughts begin to like flood into my mind because of this. And just so you know, my I, he's three now. He's perfectly fine. He has great vision. He, the, 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 the CT scans came back. He was perfectly fine. But in that moment of fear, fear can play an evil game with us. It can convince us of things that we don't normally think of ourselves. Fear is something we all deal with on different levels. Whether it's something... Uh, minuscule to something major as, you know, family member getting hurt or, or worrying about your future, worrying about what your job's going to be, worrying about who you're going to marry, worrying about uh, uh, where you're going to live, worrying about, like, like am I going to pass this class? There's so many things that we can worry about, so many things that can bring fear into our lives. We all have to deal with it, but what I want you to know today is that fear is not something that we actually have to live in, though. We were not made to live in fear. So many people have like different types of fears. Fear of the future, right? Fear of, of what their kids are going to look like. Uh, there's like the, the acronym FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Like there's, I, I try to look up how many like different fears are out there and like no website could give me like an accurate uh, answer of how many fears there are from like fears of spiders to fear of clowns to, to fear of, of being fearful. Like, like all these amazing like crazy fears. And what I found so often is that people don't, just know, don't know how to deal with their fear. And so they begin to live in a state of fear that controls them, controls their thoughts, controls their mind, controls who they are as people. But what's amazing is that God knows this. God knows 
that we were going to be people who worry and stress and have anxious anxiety about so many things in our life. And all through the Bible, we even see this. People are having to deal with fear. And so what we're going to look at today is how God has actually prepared us to overcome fear, to deal with fear in our lives. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For you, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of discipline. Let me read that again. That God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of discipline. So today I'm titling my message, A Spirit to Overcome. A Spirit to Overcome. And the question that I want us to answer today is how can we overcome a spirit of fear through the capital S, Spirit of God? We're going to be bringing this, this verse down into, as you can probably guess, three parts of power, of love, and discipline, and how those three things through the Holy Spirit can help us to face whatever it is that we're facing and to eliminate the fears that come alongside it, and not just deal with it, but to actually overcome those fears. So not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. Not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. The Holy Spirit gives us power to overcome. It's interesting that Paul, just some context of what is happening in this letter, in 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to um, his mentee, Timothy, He's in prison at this time for preaching the good news, for, for following Jesus. And he's writing to Timothy because Timothy is now becoming a pastor of a church himself. And he's wanting to encourage him, giving him some uh, imparting wisdom and encouragement as he is stepping into this calling that God has placed onto his life. And Paul begins to write things like, Fan into flame the gifts that, that God has given you when I laid my hands on you. Don't be fearful. Why? Because I bet in this time, as we can tell by the fact that Paul's in prison for being a pastor, that it wasn't easy to be in a, for being a, a pastor. That it was hard. Because if you just spoke about Jesus, you have no idea what could happen to you. You could have been put in prison. You could have been beaten. You could have been even killed. as if Because Paul was even waiting for his death. To happen. So Paul knows that Timothy is probably facing a lot of stress right now as he's moving into this calling. He's probably facing a lot of anxiety as he's moving into this calling. And Paul, in his final letter to Timothy, says, You have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. That the Holy Spirit gives us power. In fear, because what I found is that when I'm fearful, in moments when I when I when I when I feel fear beginning to like seep into like my mind, fear convinces me that I'm weak. Fear convinces me that I'm not good enough. Fear convinces me that I am something that I'm actually not. And actually, some of that's pretty true. Like, you know what? Yeah, I'm actually I am weak, in comparison to a lot of people. I don't work out. Um, I'm, I'm actually not good enough at a lot of things. But and as I'm thinking about this, as I'm looking this over, yeah, like fear isn't something that we should take lightly because it begins to convince us of all of these things. But vice versa, God is also not meant to be taken lightly. His power is not meant to be taken lightly. Because when fear wants us to believe that we are weak, the Holy Spirit is telling us that He is strong, that He is powerful, that He is more than enough to help us face whatever it is that is in front of us to overcome it, to overcome our fears. It's as if fear tells us that when we are looking at a mountain, that fear tells us that we will no way be able to climb this mountain. So to get to the other side, and the Holy Spirit is our God that says, no, you know what? Yeah, you can't climb this mountain on your own, but I've climbed this mountain many times with many other people. I know where to step. I know where to go. I know when to rest. I know how to get over this mountain, and if you trust me, if you follow me, I will give you the strength, the power that you need to overcome this mountain. Fear can trick us into thinking we're weak, we're not good enough, that we have failures, 
The list can go on and on about what fear can convince us that we have, but the Spirit is there to remind us what we truly have, and that is power. And I think many of us, including myself, this is a sermon for me, that we fail to realize the power that we actually have at our disposal. That God tells us that the same power that rose Christ from the dead is the power that lives inside of us. And if that's hard to wrap your mind around, here are just a few verses I found uh, that help describe the power of God. 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the, of the heart. Jeremiah 10, 12, It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the words by his wisdom and by his understanding, stretched out the heavens. And lastly, Isaiah 41, 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What I'm trying to get here is that we have a God who is all-powerful. His, his words spoke life into being. His very words spoke the heavens and the earth into creation. And that same power that God used to rise Christ from the dead to speak everything into existence actually lives inside of us through the Holy Spirit. But we fail to realize that and we fail to tap into that power so many times. God wants us to realize that he is enough. He has this power. Commentary I found on this particular part of this verse says, The spirit of power is the spirit of man dwelt in by the spirit of God imparting power. This power casts out fear from ourselves and stimulates us to try to cast it out of others. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love. I was interested by this because in the English dictionary, like the word love can mean a lot of things. Like I can say I love you, that means like I love you like a bro. Or I love my wife, I can use the same word for love for my wife, for, for my favorite food, for my son, for my parents, for my friends. Like you just use that one word. It doesn't really d define or give uh, the depth of what the word means. But we know the Greek translation, there's different words for love. And so I really wanted to see what word Paul was using here when he says that you have a spirit of love. And the word is agape. Same word over and over and over used again in this, uh, uh, this, this language to describe how God loves his people. The same love that drove God to leave his majesty, to leave his glory, to come and be a person. The same love that drove God to go on a cross and die for us. This is the love that Paul is talking about. And when I thought about love, when we truly find a person who loves us, no matter what our flaws are, no matter what our imperfections are, or who we are, they love us no matter what. Like my wife, she loves me or she wouldn't have married me. She loves me so much and she wants what is best for me. And because of her love for me, I can trust her, right? My wife didn't love me, like I wouldn't trust her. Like that wouldn't make sense. Like if, if my wife told me, hey, I think we should do this, even though like, it might not like, seem like the right thing right now. I, I think we should do this. I'm going to trust her decision because she wants what's best for me. She wants what's best for our family, for our kids. So I trust her and vice versa. If I was to say, hey, we're going to move to California across the country because that's where I feel like God's calling us, she trusted me and we did that. And in the same way, what Paul is reminding Timothy here and what we are being reminded as we look at this text now is that God loves us so very much. And because of that love, we should be able to trust him. Because I know in moments of fear, it's, fine, it's hard to find people to trust. 
Like, I, I have a fear of trusting people. I, I, I don't want to give you, uh, uh, I don't want you to help me because I, I can't trust you right now. But I, this fear can trick us into thinking that, but God is reminding us of his love for us, which therefore reminds us that he can be trusted in any situation, in any moment. When I think about trust, I think about uh, people in the Bible who have had to um, go out of their way, out of their like mindset to be able to trust God. Uh, the person that came to my mind was Abraham. Because Abraham followed God to this land. And he said, Abraham, look, you are going to be this great man that people are going to look to. And you're going to have all of these amazing descendants. And, and people are going to, 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 to be uh, a part of your family. But the problem was, as you probably know... Abraham didn't have a kid. <laughs> he didn't have a kid. And not only did he not have a kid, he, had, uh, he was aging. His wife, Sarah, was aging. And they're like, oh, God, like, like, I feel like my response was like, oh, that's great. Like, but here's the thing. We're barren. Like, we can't have kids. And God says, just trust me. Trust me. And you will see this come to fruition. And that's exactly what Abraham did. He trusted God. And it's really funny if you think about it. Abraham never sees the complete picture. Yeah, he sees his son. And remember, he even sees his son have, have his other sons. But he never sees the entire picture of what his descendants actually look like. But he had trust in God. He trusted him. Why? Because he knew God loved him. And he knew God wanted what was best for Abraham. For best for his family. And in the same sense, God is reminding us through his Holy Spirit that he loves us and that he can be trusted. And I was finishing up this thought. I don't know how this verse didn't come to me earlier, but it, it finally did come to me. I feel like the Holy Spirit was like, hey, you guys see this verse, you guys see this verse, you guys see this verse. 1 John 4, 18. Maybe you know it. It's pretty popular. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. That means where, where true love is, fear has no place beside it. Where true love is, fear has to leave. It has to be driven out because of what love and trusting and faith does to it. We have fears. But Jesus says, I have the solution to driving out that fear. And it's my love for you. There's one thing I want you to hear today. Above all else that I'm saying today is that God loves you so very much. And whatever it is that you're facing today, whatever it is you will face tomorrow, the fears that might come, the anxiety, the depression, the, the worry, the stress, God is saying my love is perfect for you and it will cast out and it will help you overcome what it is that you are facing. But here's the thing, though. God isn't going to force his love on us. He's not going to force us to even love him back. His love is a gift that has been freely given to us. But we have to be the ones to accept it. God wants what is best for us. And the scripture tells us he even has a plan for us. So that when we finally know that if we finally can believe and trust and put our faith in that God wants what's best for us, I mean, there's no room for worry. There's no room for any of that else to sneak into our lives because we know God has our back. That God is for us. Not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love. Not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of discipline. This is an odd one. This is, this is kind of a funny one that I felt like they kind of stood out above the two because if we're talking about what the Holy Spirit brings to the table in our lives, yeah, power. Like, that makes sense, right? Like, God's power. He wants us to be able to live in the power of Jesus. Like, that makes sense. That, that, that should be there. And love as well. Like, I, I make a bigger case for love. Like, yeah, we need to be able to understand God's love for us. And we need to be able to, to show other people God's love. And the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. But discipline? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't, like, really fit in here. And so I pulled up a Bible dictionary, found this Greek word that was there, and began to look at the different uh, definitions of, of what 
Paul might be trying to translate to Timothy that might be lost in the English translation. Now let's look at the different definitions. One that is popped up to me is like, that's it. This is what Paul's saying. And one of the definitions says this, to bring someone to his senses. To bring someone to his, to his senses. Like, that's it. Because is, is it not true that when we... Uh, begin to fear over whatever it is that you might be fearful of, we begin to like get out of our senses and, and, and believe things that, that aren't true and, and say things that we, shouldn't, that we normally wouldn't say or, or do things that we normally wouldn't do. Fear has this way of manipulating us into doing and being something that we're not. And the Holy Spirit is there to give us a spiritual slap in the face sometimes, say, hey, you need to be brought back to your sins. You are not making sense. Here is what I need you to do. Because it's not what the Holy Spirit is, right? He convicts us. He guides us. He gives us wisdom. He imparts knowledge to us. And when we don't make sense, he's there to bring us back to our senses. When we fear, when we panic, we're making a mistake, or, or we, in fear of making a mistake, we do nothing. And we've done, I've done plenty of that. And the Spirit says, no, I need you to, to get back. I'm going to bring you back to where we were. I'm going to bring you back to realizing God's power. I'm going to bring you back to realizing that God's love for you can cast out anything you're dealing with. The Israelite people, if you know the story of what they go through in the book of Exodus and into uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers, they start off in, in slavery, right? And Moses is has been equipped to lead them out. And so as they're literally leaving like their bondages behind, they're getting to the Red Sea. They turn around and like, ah, that's the uh, Egyptian army coming to bring us back. This is their response. Moses, what have you done? You've left us here to die. We, we would rather go back into slavery than have to deal with this. And then... They get through that, as we know, the Red Sea parts, and they're able to get into the wilderness, and they're going, and then they get hungry, and their, 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 their stomachs are empty, and they're like, Moses, like, you left us here to starve. We were better off in slavery, where we, at least we had full stomachs. They were better off in slavery than having some rumbling stomachs, and then as God has been leading them into towards this land that he has promised for them. They finally get to their, they're on the precipice of entering into this land that God has set for them to thrive in, to grow in. And instead of just like, just trusting God and just going, they're like, mm, we're going to send some scouts over and just see what, what's going on in there before we go, all right? Because God, you brought us this far, but let's just see if we can deal with this on our, on our own terms, okay? So they send over people, and they're like, oh man, this land is great. Like, they describe it like it's, it's flowing with milk and honey. Like, it's this amazing land. Like, yeah, who would want to live there? Oh, but there's one problem. There's this great army that have, like, giants. And they might be a little hard to beat. And so they bring this news back, and instead of being like, you know what, though? Like, the best, like, the best answer... The response should be, you know what, like, God has brought us this far. He's led us out of slavery. He's led us through here. He's gotten us this far. He will get us through whatever it is that's waiting for us on the other side. So the response should have been. But the response for the third time is mutiny. They want to get rid of Moses as their leader. Say, let's, let's, let's rise up a new leader and let's have that leader bring us back into slavery. Like, why is that they're always their go-to option when things get wrong? Like, let's go back to slavery. Like, whose answer would that be? And who would want to be the leader of that? Like, hey, sign me up. I'll lead you back into slavery. They're not making sense. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, their fear has convinced them that slavery is the best option for them instead of trusting God. And because of that, there was a consequence. They had to wander the wilderness for so many more years before they could finally finally experience this land that God had set for them. And 
that we're, we are the same way. When fear creeps its way into our minds, we have a way of just blowing things out of proportion. One of the words I could say to my wife was, it's not good, it's not good, it's not good. Like, I know how to speak good English. But for some reason, fear can, like, manipulate its way into my mind, and it just con took control over my entire body. And the Spirit is in our life to correct us, to move us forward, to bring some sense into our life when we don't make any sense, when fear has its grip on us. The Spirit is there reminding us of the two things prior, that God is powerful enough, that God is loving enough. But just like how the, the Holy Spirit is disciplining us to be able to do that, there is actually a part for ourselves to be disciplined by ourselves, the self discipline part, because Jesus, the Holy Spirit, can talk to us and talk and say, hey, hey, no, you should go into the promised land. No, you shouldn't do that. No, hey, you should trust me. But here's the thing. We have to be the ones to listen. We have to be the ones to say, okay, Spirit, I'm going to trust you. All right, Spirit, I hear what you're saying, and I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to follow you in this. Because the Spirit's telling us. He's telling us what to do. He's trying to guide us, but we have to be the ones to actually take the step. God isn't going to take that step for us. We must discipline ourselves to be disciplined by the Spirit. We must discipline ourselves to be disciplined by the Spirit. The reason why I chose this verse today to speak about, because it's actually been speaking into my heart's over the past few months. Uh, as you know, my, my wife is pregnant. We're due uh, a baby girl uh, at the beginning of the year. We're so excited. Like when you hear you're gonna have a baby girl uh, as a dad, and even for my wife as well, you begin to like think about their future, think about like what they're gonna be into, like what's gonna be her favorite color, what's gonna be her favorite food, what, if, what, what sports is she gonna play? Is she gonna actually be like into drama? Does she wanna do this? Like you begin to like think about all these amazing things your life is gonna be because now you have this new child to raise. And the, the, the induction appointment we had that uh, was supposed to tell us of the, of the gender. We get there and she was being shy, so we didn't get to actually know at that moment. But the next day, while I'm at work, my wife is at work, she gets a phone call. The doctor tells her, hey, we need you to come back because we think we saw something on the baby's heart. So we need to come down, because we, we live in Moran, and, and they told us, well, you actually need to come to the San Francisco building because there's like better treatment there and, and, and better doctors, I guess. So my wife took the phone with the doctor and she's in fear and is crying and she calls me. And I, I remember as she literally tells me this and it's like, I'm, I'm coming to your work, we're gonna have to go to the hospital, I hang up. And I could literally just feel like this spirit of fear like take over and all those thoughts and those futures that I, I wanted for my, my daughter, I could literally just like see them like vanishing, like, like what's wrong? Like, like this is going to be big, like, like a whole, uh, like something on the heart, like that's like not a joke, like that's not something that's like minor, it seems like. And so we, we, I can just like feel this fear racing over me. And as we get down to the doctor's office, they, they begin to meet with us and and they, we, we slowly begin to, to figure out that they're not so much worried about this blip on the heart, but they're worried about that what might be causing it to begin with. And say, hey, the reason why this, as we find out later that it's a hole on her heart, it might be because it's a genetic defect with your daughter. And then, <laughs> like, wait a second, I thought I was just worried about this. Now I'm going to be worried about this as well. And, and like, I thought I was already fearful at that moment. Now, like, all of these new fears begin to enter into my mind and, and over me as I'm now having to deal with this second thing as well. I'm just like, what is going to happen? 
Like I thought, th th this wasn't supposed to happen. Like my, my daughter was supposed to be like healthy and, and normal and, and joyful and cheerful. And she's supposed to make like our, our family like complete because now we have a son and a daughter. Like we had this perfect vision of what was supposed to be. And now fear is slowly picking apart all of that picture and removing it with things that shouldn't be there. And slowly in Amazingly, every test we've had since then has been positive feedback. Like, yeah, um, we, we, we did the blood test and, and they said it's very low risk that there's any genetic defect with your daughter. So we're not worried about that. We're like, great, fear removed, right? Um, they, 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 we spoke to a, cardio, a cardiologist or a, a pedi pediatric cardiologist. And she said, you know what, I'm actually not that worried about this hole in the heart. It's actually pretty common, like, that's common, <laughs> like, and she's like, it, like, we're not even gonna, like, look at it until she's born, but then it was like, we, it's been like this roller coaster, of like, great, daughter, oh, crap, there's things going on, great, it's fixed, but now it's like, so many things are coming, and it's like this roller coaster of fear over fear over fear, and I just had to tell myself one day, you know what, I'm not gonna give in to this fear anymore, my God who's powerful, my God who is loving, my God who wants what's best for me, wants what's best for my daughter, is creating her. And he knows every single intricate part of her. So I'm not gonna worry because my God has her in his hands. I had to remind myself of this verse. That in moments of fear, God has given us the greatest power we could ever need knowing that he is on our side, that if he is for us, who could stand against us? That in my moments of fear, I had to be reminded of the amazing, graciously extravagant love that God has, not only for me, but for my family as well. I had to be reminded, I had to be my sense slapped back into me by the Spirit that God is in control, that I might not be enough, but my God is more than enough. People, we are not meant to live in fear. God did not design us to live in fear. He designed us to live life to the fullest. John 10.10 10 says that the, that, 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 that the thief comes to steal that's fearful. Like, I would be very afraid if someone were to come and rob my, my house. He comes to kill. Do I have to expand on that? Like, that's pretty fearful to, to be killed. I bet I haven't witnessed that yet or, or been killed. So, and to destroy as well. All these three things are, are fear driven things that the enemy, the thief, wants to bring into our lives. But thank God the verse doesn't end there because Jesus continues and says, but I have come. I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. We can have a, we have a choice here to make today. You can live life according to your fears. You can let fear define your identity. You can let fear morph you into a person that you are not meant to be. You can let fear drive your thoughts. You can let fear drive your actions. But God says, I have a better solution for you. And it's me. It's my Holy Spirit giving you power, giving you love, giving you discipline. So that you might have the opportunity to live life to the fullest. We are not meant to live in fear. We are meant to overcome fear. So in moments of fear... My encouragement to you is to lean on the spirit that God has given to you. We sometimes focus so much on God the creator or God the father. We focus so much on, on what Jesus did. And we should, those two, those two like, like we need to focus on those two. But sometimes because there's not like this amazing story of the Holy Spirit, there's not this like tangible spirit that we see, we tend to, to leave that part out. Or we just tend to just maybe forget about it or are not viewed as, as important as Jesus or God. But the Holy Spirit is just as important as Jesus and God. And we have the opportunity to tap into the Spirit of God. We have to be the ones, though, to do it. 
So lean in on the Holy Spirit. Lean on him in moments of fear. And remember, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and discipline. So live in this truth. Live in the spirit of God that he has so lovingly given us. And today, maybe, maybe you're like, yeah, like I've gotten the power. And I'm like, I, like, I understand God's power, and that's great. And, 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 I, and I've done so well to work with that. But, but I'm having trouble understanding his love for me. Let us pray for you. Let us give you scripture. Let us give you encouragement on how you can better understand God's love. Maybe it's vice versa. Maybe you, you have the love thing down, but you, but you don't have the power down. Let's do the same thing. Let us help guide you in seeing the power that God is ready to give you. And lastly, maybe you just need some sense knocked into you. Let me go over and just give you a little slap real quick and maybe see if that helps. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to slap you. But let's begin this conversation of how you can better hear the Spirit when He is speaking to you. So I pray that you come and you respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.